Now, having said all this, the fact is, as I mentioned before, this system could not have existed without the acquiescence of the rest of the country. And that is symbolized by the role of the Supreme Court in the general retreat from Reconstruction. Um, one could go in, I don't have the time to, give, to go in detail to all these Supreme Court cases. There was no one case that said, okay, Reconstruction's over. There were a series of cases over 30 years that little by little whittled away at the 14th Amendment, the 15th Amendment, and the general principle of equal protection of the law. It started during Reconstruction itself with what we call the slaughterhouse cases, which had to do with, um, was actually a case brought by white butchers in Louisiana. The Reconstruction government of Louisiana had established a monopoly of slaughtering, of slaughtering animals, um, be on, the on public health grounds, that they, they had to be inspected, a, a, sta a local government-operated slaughterhouse was set up so that the quality of meat could be inspected and everything. But white butchers who were not part of the monopoly sued on the grounds that their rights under the 14th Amendment, particularly the right to free labor, to pursue a livelihood, which was part of the liberty guaranteed under the 14th Amendment, was being violated. Well, this went up to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court rejected their, their plea. In some ways, it was a pro-Reconstruction decision in that they were trying to uphold the authority of a Reconstruction-era government. This was an interracial Reconstruction government that had passed that law, and the Supreme Court upheld it against the challenge. But in doing so, it basically said, you know, the 14th Amendment was not really aimed at changing the federal system. Most of the rights we have are still under the state, come from state law. There are only a few law, uh, rights you get as a citizen of the country rather than a citizen of the state. What were some of those nat national rights? Well, the right to petition the government. All right, that's one. The right to travel on the high seas without pirates seizing you. That wasn't of great interest to most um, former slaves. Most rights were still at the state level, it said. That, that didn't have that much of an effect at that moment, but as the redeemers came into power, uh, this dim diminution of national power uh, would have very serious effects. In 1875 came the case of U.S. v. Cruikshank. I mentioned this briefly. This arose out of the Colfax Massacre in Louisiana. The, only a couple of people were indicted in the end, and the indictments for these murders were overturned by the Supreme Court, basically emasculating the Ku Klux Klan Act. The federal government does not have the right to go in and prosecute ordinary crimes, murder, assault, etc. Again, reducing the federal authority and saying it's really up to the states. It made it very difficult for the federal government to use its power to protect these basic constitutional rights. Um, 1883, one of the worst decisions in Supreme Court history, the civil rights cases, which overturned the civil rights law of 1875, which had tried to demand what, you know, what we've called equal public rights, that is non-discrimination in places of public accommodation, restaurants, hotels, theaters, etc. There the court in an eight to one decision said, no, the 14th Amendment only applies to state action, not private action. State action, a law discriminating, that's no good under the 14th Amendment. But private action by a business, an entrepreneur, that's not covered under the 14th Amendment. Um, this is a distinction no historian takes seriously, public and private action. Every private company that serves the public in some ways is licensed or regulated or makes use of public facilities. It would be very easy to say, no, they, you, it's not a question of who you have in your home. If you open yourself up to public business, you've got to treat everybody equally. But the court was unwilling to go, uh, to go that far. And then, of course, in 1896, Plessy v. Ferguson. Now, Plessy v. Ferguson has to do with a law. This is state action, a law of Louisiana mandating that railroad companies have separate cars for black and white uh, passengers. Um, the challenge to that law was organized by the remnants of the old free black leadership from, in New Orleans 
from the Reconstruction days. They called themselves the Citizens Committee. Citizens, very important. They're still trying to assert their equal citizenship. As I've mentioned, they hired Albion Turgi, a famous carpetbagger, to fight this case all the way to the Supreme Court. And of course, the court upheld the Louisiana law, saying that laws that separate the races are not a violation of the 14th Amendment and its guarantee of equal protection, so long as the facilities are separate but equal, right? Blacks are put in one car, whites in another. What's the problem here? They're both being treated the same. Whites can't go in the black car. Blacks can't go in the white car. There's no discrimination. And if the, train, if the cars are both OK, that's fine. So this opened the door to the massive implementation of segregation by law in every area of life uh, in the South. The, this was an eight to one decision. The lone dissenter, John Marshall Harlan, was a former slave owner from Kentucky. And Harlan, Harlan's dissent, one of the great Supreme Court documents of our history, was a disquisition not about segregation, but about freedom and the Civil War and what the emancipation of slavery meant. And his target was not separation, but racial domination. In the majority opinion, Chief Justice White had talked about the dominant race. He talked about the fact that whites are the dominant race, and blacks basically have to just get used to this. Harlan said, this is a contradiction to the principle of equality spawned by the Civil War. Freedom meant the right to participate equally and fully in American society. And that separation, segregation was a way of stigmatizing one group of citizens as unfit to associate with another group of citizens. And that in itself was a violation of equality, regardless of whether the train cars were the same or not. And a century later, Americans would look back on segregation as a relic of an era of crude prejudice. But in fact, at the time, it was widely supported by religious leaders, by scientific thinkers, by political figures, as a way of avoiding racial violence. This was the alternative to lynching. If you keep people apart, they're not going to get into fights anymore. They're not going to uh, uh, dominate each other physically. It's actually a, 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 a positive, progressive uh, way of dealing with race relations. Now, of course, the facilities were never actually, they were separate but never equal. This is a famous juxtaposition of two schools in a, southern, in a Virginia town in the early 20th century, around 1920, this is the black school and this is the white school, you see? The white school is brick, it's very nicely built, etc. The black school is uh, more of a kind of a shack kind of thing. Um, but, um, so, but segregation was now, now became implemented in everything, you name it, public parks, libraries, shops, hotels, prisons, cemeteries. There were laws against black and white people riding together in taxis. There were laws against black and white people playing chess together, all sorts of things. In other words, oh, and the one final thing, in 1898, two years after this, Williams v. Mississippi, the court heard a challenge to the Mississippi Constitution and its disenfranchisement provisions. And the, the statistics were clear. No blacks were voting anymore in Mississippi. This was outright discrimination. Court said, mm, we can't deal with that. There is nothing on the face of these measures that is racial. The 15th Amendment bars discrimination on the basis of race. They don't mention race. Poll tax, literacy, no race. How it's implemented at the local level is not our problem. The Supreme Court can't be a policeman going around making sure that every voter registrar is acting in a proper way. So there is nothing on the face of it that, that makes this seem like a violation of the 15th uh, Amendment. The point is that the Supreme Court was intended by the Founding Fathers to be the most conservative branch of government. That's why it's there. That's why it has life terms. They don't have to get elected, re-elected. It's to keep a lid on 
what Madison and the others thought were the dangers of excessive popular enthusiasm. And that's what the Supreme Court ha is today and has always has been, with the exception of the Warren Court. It has always been a conservative branch of government. But vis-a-vis -vis the 14th and 15th Amendments, the court in all these decisions interpreted the 14th and 15th Amendment in the most narrow possible way. Now, remember, the 14th and 15th Amendment are ambiguous. The language is vague. They're open to many interpretations. But over time, the court has interpreted them, even today, in the like recent voting rights uh, uh, decision, in the narrowest possible way, rather than adopting a more expansive um, interpretation. And some of this is based on a historical reading of Reconstruction. I did an article a couple of years ago just looking at the footnotes of Supreme Court decisions. Which historians do they cite on when they talk about this? And long after historians had begun to challenge the old traditional view, it was popping up over and over again in Supreme Court decisions. In the 1950s, they were still quoting Claude Bowers, one of the worst books of history ever written, but still <laughs> cited in Supreme Court um, decisions. Eventually, they stopped, of course. Today, they're more up to date. But here's the problem. Jurisprudence is based on precedent. A series of flawed decisions, from slaughterhouse to civil rights uh, and to Crookshank, remain on the books. They remain good law. The, even the Warren Court only overturned Plessy v. Ferguson. They would not overturn, they would never say the Supreme Court has been consistently wrong in its 14th Amendment jurisprudence. They worked around it rather than confronting it. So for example, the Civil Rights Act of 1964 was upheld under the Commerce Clause, not the 14th Amendment. They did not try to reinvigorate the 14th Amendment, which they could have and should have done. Um, so this is another example of how of history is embedded in the very nature of Supreme Court decisions, because they're based on precedent. And if those precedents are based on a misreading of history, then we have you know, then it's still affecting the present uh, in which we live. 